Welcome to the Apologetics.com radio show. I am Harry Edwards. I am your host for this evening. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, my guests, my my normal, regular panelists are, are right here with me, Dr. Jacob Daniel. How are you doing? Very well, Harry. Good to be here. All right. And uh, Lenny Esposito, how are you doing? Doing fine. Doing great. Glad to, glad to engage it once again. I know. Uh, I can't believe it's been a month since we were last year. Yeah. And before you know it, it's going to be October. Yeah. It's crazy. Christmas it's, is already here. Yeah, that's just, right. That's right. You just 14 only have to weeks. That's all we have. <laughs> In the Philippines, you know, it's already Christmas, you know. That, that's just how it is. When September hits, it's Christmas there. I think I mentioned to you, Harry, that we all are turning into Filipinos, you know. That's right. You just have to go to Costco and see that's if right. they already have Christmas trees and everything. That's right. Set up. <laughs> oh, the Christmas trees are up. That means ha- Halloween is just around the corner. <laughs> or they by- bypassed it, I think, at Costco, right? Yeah. Uh, that's that's okay by me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So um, I don't know why we're happy because we're going to be talking about some really depressing things here. <laughs> but um, we are continuing in our discussion of Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. We're on Chapter 5 now. He titled it The Emergence of Plastic People. Now, I was thinking that maybe he got the, that term plastic people from maybe a quote by one of the German philosophers we're going to be uh, highlighting this evening. But uh, no, I didn't see that. Yeah. But in a moment, you, you'll see, uh, dear listeners, how Truman, you know, why he titled his chapter this way, The Plastic People, because, well, I won't spoil it just right now. Yeah. Uh, but before we get into our show, I do want to mention something about the book. It's a it's a great book. I think it's a must read, and um, maybe hold it up to one of the cameras if you you have it right there. Yep, it's that's that's the book. Uh, highly rated by people I respect, such as Rod Dreher and Ben Shapiro. And what's notable about that is. These authors, they write in those in those areas, and, and yet they're recommending Truman's book. Uh, so that's, that's really good. That shows how important it is. If you care to know how culture is changing, and we hear that a lot. You, you, you might hear that from your friends at church or from your Bible study group, your neighbors, your family members, how things seem to be so different now. And I'm old enough to actually uh, see that there's some credence to that, you know, like we're living in a different world now, especially after the pandemic. But politically, we're so divided. We are entertaining strange ideas like we can become a man if you're a woman, or if you're a woman, we can, we can become a man. Uh, we talk about pronouns and how that's a big deal. We talk about uh, just all these weird and strange ideas. Uh, they're foreign to us. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, do you guys get that sense too? Like uh, you, you hear that from your friends or from your um, family members, your um, acquaintances, or just just even in the media, right? It, it just seemed pretty, pretty bleak. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? Unfortunately, I, I find that people understand those kinds of phrases too well. They should be more foreign uh, than they strike many people these days. And that's because we are all, and one of the points that we'll talk about today is we're all absorbing so much from pop culture, from the cultural dendris of the arts today that, that we see and that are modeled for us with purpose, with a specific, you know, goal in mind to normalize abnormal positions. It should be more foreign than it is. And um, it, it isn't, which is, which is actually bothersome to me. It, it, to say you're born in the wrong body should be a, what are you talking about? It's yeah. like I have, right, there, there's the old joke, hey, I have my Shoes on the wrong feet. What are you talking about? Those are the only feet I have, you know. <laughs> so, right. I think what um, we are witnessing is the fulfillment of the world's attempt to disciple us. 
We I think that it's only yeah. church discipling the world, yeah. but I think the world has an intention to disciple us as well. Yeah. And we have given into it. Uh, so what has happened, I believe, is the whole thing that Carl Truman talks about. Uh, we have come to uh, recognize truth as something that we look within, yeah. not without, yeah. not yeah. outside. And by doing so, then we want to be in control. We want to control our destiny, our present and future and everything. Uh, and in so doing, uh, you know, we position ourselves in a place of a huge responsibility. And we have no idea what we are getting into. Yeah. I mean, driving down here, we talked about the whole idea. Just the church, they they seem to be in a fog about a lot of this. They know something is wrong, but they can't quite... Uh, get to the bottom of it. They don't know how we got here. It's just a lot of strange things all at once. And uh, if you, uh, if one reacts to it, even slightly negatively, you get canceled and you're the worst person. And so we're less gracious. Uh, uh, we get irritated easily. We're offended easily. And, uh, and again, what we want to talk about is just the ideas uh, that have brought a lot of this about yeah and what's worse is there's the younger generation there's there's our our kids and those who are off to college young adults and those others who will see that bristling that offense and not only not understand it but don't even understand why such a thing should exist so so it's foreign to them the traditional structures are are foreign to them and we're seeing this max mass exodus from the church because of it, right? Because we don't have the answers as leaders in the church or even as parishioners in the church for our kids. And they say, so what they assume is, well, you're just hateful. Right. And uh, who wants to be around bigots? Who wants to be around hateful people? Well, if you, well, if your faith can't make you better than being hateful, then why should I have any part in your faith? Yeah, yeah I, I would point to two things. One is that I think uh, within the church itself, we created an environment, and I agree with Van Til when he says that culture is religion ex externalized. Mm -hmm. In the Western context, if we see Christianity has turned into me-centered worship, yeah. me-centered uh, sermons, me-centered you know, uh, uh, way of understanding the world, and in a way it kind of trickled down into the culture, and when yeah. it's working out, we are waking up and seeing a we didn't expect this yeah. to be the outcome, but that's what it is. I think uh, we are to be blamed as well. This this is why we need to be checking where we are uh, uh, in terms of our engagement with the world. And not just that, also understanding where we are as a culture and how we can actually bring the truth of the gospel to defend truth and to fight against these forces. Yeah, I, I just want to remind our listeners again that we at Apologetics.com, we take seriously the you know first chronicles 1232 it's something i've read many times here on the show it's the men of issachar who understood the times and to know what israel ought to do so not only uh, and these were counted among david's mighty men you know these were uh, alongside the soldiers the uh, the his army they were men of valor but they had a particular purpose they, I guess they were men who understood the times. They thought that was important. And the second part to that is they knew what to do. They, they I guess, informed or advised Israel what they ought to do. And um, sometimes I wonder if we have that kind of a, a structure in our churches today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even sure if uh, a bunch of apologists fulfill that. You know, we were yeah. talking about how there are many brands of apologetics, many styles, many philosophies behind apologetics. We at apologetics.com believe that uh, a cultural approach for the moment right now is effective. Uh, so I, I firmly believe that. it. Uh, we can easily form bridges to those we're trying to reach. It at least makes them, makes people think, you know, that at least we're trying to bring people to an understanding of our times. So this book, again, I uh, can't recommend it highly enough. Purchase it so that you could read along with us. Uh, look at, you know, uh, the past shows are on our site, and it's on uh, Apple Podcasts as well. Uh, and uh, our hope is that it, it's very helpful as you go through the book with us. 
If the book is a little too difficult, there's an easier version called Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution. So I think Carl Truman actually does a good job with trying to weave a thread of all of these ideas and finally coming to understand how we got to this place, coming from the Enlightenment thinkers, the Romantics, and we're, so we're moving along. We're, we're kind of like in the 19th century now, and we want to talk about three, I guess these are German philosophers, Nietzsche, Marx, well, Darwin's not. Darwin's uh, not. Darwin, yeah, all right, so he escaped that charge right there. And, and their contribution and how, um, see, I believe, all right, I, I definitely believe that there is a genealogy of ideas here. What I'm not ac actually sure of, and, and you guys can chime in on this, I think it helps explain perhaps how culture changes and, and, and adapts and adopts these um, ideas. I'm not exactly sure if these ideas cause societal ills today. You know, um, maybe I could be wrong. Although nowadays, what I want to, my conclusion in this is, is that it's a nice uh, parallel now, whether it ca whether their ideas have caused our societal ills today or not, it definitely can help us understand where some of these um, behaviors come from. Even if the ideas were not the cause of it, at least here's what I'm trying to say. When we observe culture today, the people in the culture, the citizens, may not understand what's going on. For them to understand it, they'd have to go to these thinkers, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Th does that make sense? or Because uh, it's a happy coincidence in, in some ways, right? Where uh, e even Nietzsche's own writing, he kind of predicts what's going to happen because he, he's, he saw what happened in the Enlightenment, how we jettisoned God, all right? And now we have to make ourselves God because... He understood that God was the glue in, in all of reality. Now, God no longer is necessary in his conclusion. We now have to be gods, right? Yeah, I think uh, Paul is very clear in Romans. We read about the distinction is merely between two, uh, the creation and the creator. If we don't have the creator, God, and not just any God, God of the Bible on the throne, we will put the creation yeah, in his place, and uh, there is no third option with regards to that. Um, so uh, this is what I would say, Harry. I think ideas do in inform our action. One thing that the West needs to do, and as an Easterner, I can see it very much clearly. What's been described here from a Western perspective, it's kind of like the the very shadow of this is found in the Eastern world in many form. And it works out economically, it works out socially, it works out spiritually, it works out. So I think there's a need for people here in the West to really understand where they are heading to based on these ideas if they'll only look at the East and see where they had ended up in terms of the difference between the order and the disorder, uh, circular reasoning and, and the logical reasoning and all those variations that are there. And I think we are shifting culturally in the West, more to look like East ideologically. Mm. So ideas, it is definitely a challenging thought with the ideas cause or yeah, what's yeah, caused, yeah. caused would, the idea. So. Yeah, I would say that there are certain presuppositions that we now hold that were originated in each of these thinkers. So nobody in modern biology holds to a classically Darwinist model. It doesn't work, and it, they know that. But the concept that the fundamental idea of survival of the fittest, natural selection and random mutation is enough to get us the diversity of life in which we see, that, presupp that presupposes, okay, now we're going to base all of our models on those ideas. We're not going to even just question that. Uh, Nobody, there, there are very few Nietzscheans 
in the world today. It, it, most people, if you say, well, what did Nietzsche believe? I mean, they may, somebody may say, oh, I, Nietzsche believed God is dead. And that's right. an oversimplification of what Nietzsche taught, clearly. But the idea that existence precedes essence, the idea that you aren't beholden to any specific nature that you are merely a captive to natural surroundings or or the way you were raised and you can break free of it and become anything and everything, whatever you'd like. That idea is a presupposition that right in, in we have in we have it in spades in America. You can be whatever you want to be. Uh, it, it all depends on what's the and it's a, it's very Disney esque, you know. Search for the real you. It's, it, that that's that's be true to yourself. We sing about it all the time. It's like, well, what is the real you? You don't even you know there there may be aspects of who you are that you can't evolve. Yeah. And then Marxian idea that that your your external surroundings actually shape who you are, and that's all that you need to do is explain that and you can you can reshape who you are by either changing your surroundings or recognizing that those surroundings are are illegitimate and trying to overcome yeah. them all of those ideas are the presuppositions upon which modern society uh, and one of the key presuppositions that we we've been actually touching on is the idea that human beings are basically fundamentally like blank slate yeah tabula rasa yeah uh, uh, and they get corrupted by the the system or the institutions that are the products of the the social construct right that come up with so you know what I was going to clarify earlier uh, it, it's more clear to me now what I'm what I was trying to say a few minutes ago was I feel like uh, in the last few years we've had a lot of riots we've had a lot of protests we cancellations like cancel cultures and all that stuff I feel like for whatever reason, I mean, we could debate what caused all of that. But now what I see, what I'm trying to say, what I see is a lot of justification, whether it's conscious or not, uh, to these ideas. And they actually match. So again, the whole, um, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about kind of like the cancel culture, um, a lot of Marx idea, Marxism uh, that's going on right now, a lot of socialism, talk on socialism. That's kind of like the thing nowadays to talk about. Uh, it's become vogue and vogue, right? Uh, but now we are bringing these thinkers and it is providing a foundation for these uh, behaviors. So in a sense, good for them. How do you think the church ought to react to these things? What is now the duty of the church mm. now that these things are coming to light like i know for for instance vadi bachman right what, what's bachman. Him? yeah bachman uh you see him all over the internet now and he, he likes to talk about these kinds of issues and, and i i think that's good i commend him for that but what about the rest of uh, church leaders what do you feel uh, their duty is now that these things are kind of out in the open maybe this this will uh give a sense of where we are as a culture. So what we're doing is that because we have banished God out of our culture, he's no more the, the standard by which we receive con, um, constraints in our life. If we keep God aside, then all you're left with is this idea of looking forward to some kind of uh, a moral and social evolution that you become part of. Now, you you only have to look at the tech, uh, the the technocrats for example they run on this idea of uh, innovation through disruption you have to disrupt to innovate and there is this idea of being progressive looking forward to a progressive future and i think we are implementing that on our social sphere as well where we are always wanting to be updating ourselves mm. our nature right so you have to reinvent and you have to try different things. You need to, uh, so there is nothing, so that's why the whole idea of even deconstruction comes in. We have to deconstruct, whereas replace it with something that you think to be more valid and need to be affirmed. And that's another thing as well. So um, earlier, it, uh, the, the stages before where we are right now, it was all about basically replacing God and putting yourself in place of creating your own identity. Now what we have done is actually we have jumped from there 
to the idea that it has to be affirmed now by the society. It has to be accepted as truth and valid. And one thing that we need to understand that especially young people, they are under pressure right now because of creating that self-identity and they find that to be authentic self. And when that gets uh, resisted by their parents, by people in church and uh, people in community, they feel that their authentic self is under threatened. Yeah. Uh, and that's where we are. So it's not. A, it, it's a very complex situation right now, but it all comes down to this whole idea of uh, not having that tangible foundation, that solid foundation that we have replaced, as Nietzsche would say, yeah. we have killed God, yeah. right? And replaced him with something that is not as tangible. And that's and a good segue, actually. Let's talk a little bit about Nietzsche because that's covered in the chapter. What what would you say his biggest contribution to this whole disruption of culture right now? Like we know that um, he rebelled against the Enlightenment and and, and basically we all agree that he he at least was was genuinely, he, he wasn't lying about this. He wasn't making things up. He kind of knew the ramifications if God uh, is no longer in the picture, right? right? He, and so, unlike the new atheists who said, well, well, just because we don't believe in God doesn't mean we're not moral. Nietzsche understood that, well, our morality is based on a God-centric world. Yeah. And if you take God out of that picture, then you've you've undercut the very foundation that grounds your morality. So a new morality will have to arise whatever that is, and, and it becomes, you know, a, a kind of a pragmatism, really, um, instead of uh, his belief system was uh, perspectivism, you know, in his understanding of morals aren't anything set in stone, and and uh, we are halfway between the beast and, and the uberman. We, we, we have such a long way to go because we have to understand and finally overcome with the will to power in order to in order to create this newer more enabled race to well the second nature the right. second the nature man yeah so yeah. so nietzsche is the first one to to say really we're decoupling everything from there there's there's no constraints to humanity there's no human nature that says that you can only go this far in either direction and and so you're set in this box and that's all you can do. You know, he says you can do anything. Uh, we can completely re but it's going to cost. Yeah. It's going to cost the current society. And it's it's going to be probably incredibly painful in the process because you're reinventing every aspect of who you are in, and what you believe. And I think it's in one sense, it's also countercultural. It's not just about the individual reinventing. Yeah. And exactly. crafting their identity. It's also about changing language, for example. Sure. How we actually change meaning over time. Right. And I think that's a major fight, even within the church as well, yeah. that we have capitulated to the idea that words no more mean the same thing, so we have to abandon them completely. Right. Yeah. Even within the Christian world. And we're doing that even in the scripture as well. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think what, what needs to happen is that we need to be even more forceful in fighting for the truth and the meaning that is set yeah. already. I, I, so, so to your other question, what, what should the church do? Yeah, I think we need to show that there are certain constraints, that, so, but we also need to show the beauty and the value that we can as church, as people who are followers of Christ, attain to. And we don't do the positives as well as the negatives. Sometimes we do negatives by themselves, but we need to do both. We need to show yeah. the goals. Well, I hear the music, which means we are up for a station break. So we've been discussing Chapter 5 of Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. We'll be right back after a few messages. Well, welcome back to the Apologetics.com radio show. My name is Terry Edwards, and I'm your host for this evening, and we have been talking about Carl Truman's book titled um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's a good book, something, it's a book I'd recommend highly. It helps us understand the times we're in, and um, 
we've been talking about chapter five. In that chapter, Carl Truman highlights the ideas of Nietzsche, Marx, and Darwin, and how they have really provided a way for us to understand our current culture. So I was mentioning a while ago how things seem to be going at a dizzying pace. Uh, We're not understanding what's going on in our culture. People seem to be divided, seem to be angry, seem to have a short fuse, and we entertain all sorts of strange ideas. And um, there's a good quote where really the context of the phrase, God is dead, and it's attributed to Nietzsche, but the context behind it is far more enlightening. It it gives a lot of good understanding of uh, how a philosopher during the 19th century would would think. And here, and this is Nietzsche, who was in a way reacting to the Enlightenment when the Enlightenment pretty much did away with God because reason, just because apparently reason can explain things and somehow explain away God. So if that truly is the case where God is no longer part of our lives, no, n- not part of uh, our reality, then things literally are untethered and things fall apart. And I like this part where in book three of, uh, his, of Nietzsche's work, The Joyful Wisdom, he, he said this, Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Uh, He goes on, and uh, it's pretty depressing. And so here's a man, right, who understands what happens when God does not exist. And so how do we compare that to today's uh, spirit of the age when when it seems like we don't think about God and God's not part of our lives, uh, this culture is perfectly happy, well, that's in quotes, you know, to live without God. Is it any surprise uh, why we're going through all of this? Yeah. yeah. yeah so let's take, let's take a perspective. I was listening to a, a talk on slavery and how the word slave is used in the Bible and why there are allowances for slaves and slave owners in the Bible. And the speaker, I believe it was Peter Williams, uh, made a very good point. He said, you have to understand that through most of human history, the idea of subjugation was assumed. Everyone had some form of subjugation. Everyone was a subject of someone else. If you were a slave in the Greek and Roman era, you had a master. If you were um, a conquered people, you had a mastered people. But that master also had a master, the, the, the hierarchy of Rome. And the king was a slave, a subject of God, and he should be beholden to God. So there was always a hierarchy. It was just a question of who your master was, not whether you were a subject, a, a slave, that whether you were beholden. Um, whether you had to submit to a authority or not. Now, today we use the word submit, and, and you hear this all the time in marriage conferences, right? Oh, you know, Ephesians 5, the wife must submit to her husband, and, and everybody bristles. And if you were to say, well, you are a subject, you are beholden, you have to submit to a higher authority— People in America now bristle. What do you mean I have to submit to the church leadership? What if I don't want to? Well, maybe I'll just find me a different church. Maybe I'll just, you know, what do you mean our church has to submit to the doctrinal authority of the denomination or the convention or whatever the ruling entity is? No, we're just going to break free and or we'll have a church split or so 
that idea of submission is one that we've jettisoned. But this is exactly what Nietzsche is saying. He's saying when you lose that understanding, when you want to become your own individual, now you're floating free. And if you're your own ruling authority, then whatever rules you want to make up will work. But nobody else has to follow them either. And so now you're going to get chaos. And so I think that's a good way that maybe we can conceptualize what he's saying in modern terminology is, you know, the people say, well, the Bible talks about slavery. And yet everybody thinks that antebellum slavery is, is evil. It was evil, absolutely, and Christians fought against it. But you have to understand the people of the day throughout all of history understood that there's some level of submission. So the reading about slavery in the Bible and the protections that God puts in place for slaves shouldn't be something to cause consternation. It should be, hey, at least God is putting protections in place so it's not overly abusive. And I think the biblical idea when we talk about sanctification of individual is through a process. It's a daily sanctification. Yeah. And I think that applies to the, the, the culture as well, that, it, that God is interested in redeeming. Um, uh, even with cultures, with God, when, we, when you're talking about slavery, God is dealing with people uh, who are given into that kind of system and applying that in their context. God is working through that, and that's why we— and it's not through the way of revolution, it's through the way of reformation. And that's a major difference that we find. Um, so I think when we enthrone ourselves, uh, in one sense we become very presentist. Yeah. We become uh, we, we seek justice here and now. It has to be, that's why the whole cancel culture, right? That we are witnessing that you need to be canceled now. We can talk about it later. Yeah, right? that's, we, and that's very Marx. That, yes. That's where the Marxist ideology comes in. Even with statues, we need to bring them down now, yeah. and we can talk about it later, right? Yeah. So so, so I think that, uh, that, that idea of abandoning process, that is one of the symptoms of the culture in that's which we are point. living. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, focus in on the whole recreating ourselves, the idea of recreating ourselves. So Nietzsche definitely understood that if you untether reality from God, then everything is just chaos. Uh, so I, I read just a, an excerpt of some of his uh, thoughts there. But I like what he said in, in that famous line, right? He, he goes, must we ourselves, remember he's declaring through uh, his character, the madman, that we have killed God, right? And so he, he goes, must we, he, he asked a question, which is a great rhetorical question, must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the answer is yes. What else is there, right? If, uh, so that's a huge way of giving permission to, let's say, our culture today to say, yes, since God is dead, you can, you must recreate yourself. You must be something else. In fact, he does say that that is what I'm calling his salvation. Is And he calls it, uh, I call it his salvation. That's my term, all right, Nietzsche's salvation. Maybe I should write an article on that one. But uh, he actually uses the term uh, second nature or new nature. Very appropriate because uh, you, you need to become, you have to assume the place of God or else things fall apart. Yeah, and I think uh, it's not always at individual level, and I connect with what you were saying, Lenny. Um, th there is that longing. I think it's innate in us to submit to something or some right. It's there. And so what happens is that when we are reinventing and crafting our identity as individuals, uh, we finally find satisfaction not just in creating our identity, but in the affirmation of that identity. So in so doing, what we do is actually we want to belong to a, a, a identity group. That's what happens. And then that identity, identity group takes over, uh, it, it control over our lives, right? And that's when we have ultimately the dependence on the collective. Mm -hmm. So in so doing, we not just lose individualism, but we lose the individual itself. Yeah, ironically, that's what happens, right? right? That's yeah. what happens. Yeah. And, and we, uh, we give or, or delegate that very authority that we thought we would have to the collective. Yeah, and and that's a great segue. I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Jacob 
Daniel. Uh, perfect segue to Marx. Let's talk about Marx. So Marx did see the bad effects of the Industrial Revolution and probably saw that the individual is lost. And so now it's just the collective. And what, what did he pretty much relegated everything to just the bourgeois against the uh, proletariat. Yeah, proletariat. Uh, it's just a means of production, and that seems to not be fair. And Yeah, Marx saw rising. everything in economic right. terms. Right, right. It, it, he boiled, and obviously that was a hang-up for him be, because there are people who are motivated by things other than economics. Uh, some are motivated by power. Some are motivated by love or, or baser instincts of sex, things like that. Uh, but for Marx, economics was the driver, and he was he was definitely a man of his day. Yeah, but he didn't really have foresight into understanding what could be. I mean, obviously, the emergence of the middle class blew his entire theory. The revolution apart. didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he you now, if you think if you put yourself in Marx's place, what what are we talking about? The eighteen forties. That means that. And uh, not only did the French Revolution, which was a much more clear picture from a German perspective than the American Revolution, which was a faith mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally driven revolution, yeah. uh, as but the French Revolution was very secular and it was a, as much against the Catholic Church as it was against the king. And that wasn't working out and it needed to happen Again, right in the by eighteen forties, it, it it still they still had the dust still had settled on it. You had Napoleon, and that was a problem. And then they had another revolution. It was a whole mess. So Marx, I think, is much commenting on the current events of his day and saying, "Well, it's because these people are so poor, and the king is, you know, sitting up there in his high palace, let them eat cake and all that. Uh, of course, they're going to revolt. It's all about the money." And even today, we hear that, right? If those poor people could just get a living minimum wage, then they would be better. And um, we know that's not true because we've seen what's happened with uh, with folks who've won the lottery. They all go bankrupt, right. and they're you know it, it's it's it maybe it's the people who are poor at managing money that are poor, as opposed to the other way around. And, Correlation and causation are two questions. And what we see is that the spirit continues. And when revolution didn't happen, um, a class struggle turned into a race struggle. Right. So, right. so what you had the you had the Grand Prix school, yeah, yeah. and and Horkheimer, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to marry Marx and Freud. Yeah. That was their whole passion, uh, and they drafted later on guys like Derrida, uh, Sartre. Uh, Foucault, who were all influenced by Nietzsche, by the way. Okay. And that's where Nietzsche comes in. And then so you have all of this mixed, you're right. And instead of economic struggle, you're absolutely right. They put it on, on class or race. And uh, that was then broadened in the 1980s and the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, social studies the 60s department. too, right? 60s, well, 60s yeah. But, but the when, riots. But that gets broadened with, with, with queer theory, with you know, mm. intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw, that doesn't come out to 1989. Uh, and all of these other feminist, second wave feminist theory, which doesn't, that starts showing up in the 70s and then the early 80s. But all of this coalesces and this is where you get the, the critical theory writ large that we see today. Yes. Oh, that's to say that yeah. this is all connected. Yeah. Right. And it's it important is. that we understand, as you said early on, uh, how did we arrive where we are? Mm -hmm. And to analyze yeah. uh, these ideas is so vital. It, it seems like, again, uh, a lot of, again, we're talking about ideas from almost 200 years ago. But it's interesting that in some ways ideas creep in very, very slowly. Yeah. They come in, in vogue at certain times. They get out of fashion. But in the last, I want to say the last few years, maybe a decade or so, of t uh, not not too long ago, um, it's becoming solidified, and and that's the scary part because now their actions are uh, justified by ideas, and and that to me right. is scary. You know, that's scary to me. It's not like we can imagine a rebellious teenager just acting up, but now we have adults that actually have weapons that could destroy. You know, that that that's the analogy in my mind. The difference that, that we're seeing today. Versus, let's say, in the 1990s or 80s. Well, I think it's interesting that, take take Marxist ideology. 
there seems to be there's an initial wave post Marx, and the communists start the early 1900s. You have, of course, the Leninists, which is one form of that that happens uh, in Russia and those areas, uh, and that lasts for a certain period of time. In the West, we hear from those people. We see the that we see the oppression. We right. see the way it doesn't work, and we see the desire of those who are under its captivity wishing to escape. Now, we're 40 years removed from that. We, there's a generation of people who don't remember the time of captivity in Egypt, right? They're, 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 well, we've won, too. Don't forget, right? right? Tear and down so this now wall. It's, yeah. Now it's easy yeah. to romanticize that, and there's nobody coming over saying, right. hey, you know, now there are still people alive who lived under Ceausescu and and some of the evils of that oppressive. Maybe system. we can plug in uh, Rod Dreher's book "Live Not by Lies" yeah. to read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it's it's easy for a younger generation to just simply be ignorant of that and to think that it's all idealistic because now we're we've forgotten our past. Right. And Freud is the same way. Uh, you, Freudian psychology was a big idea in the early to mid 1900s. Fell out of disfavor as we students started finding out that there were medications that could treat certain mental maladies, uh, schizophrenia, and things like that. Now we've swung so far into the idea that we think that every mental problem should be medicated, which is not necessarily true either. But nobody is practicing psychoanalysis. I mean, just uh, any of the psychoanalysis is out there would just love to have patients come to them instead of taking pills, but that's not what, doctor, can you prescribe me something because I'm depressed, is what you'll hear. And, uh, but some of his Freudian ideas that stuck were the ones that said, oh, sex is central to who we are, and and I like sex, so that must be central to who I am. And it was filtered through Kinsey and, and Masters and Johnson, and we see all of that happening afterwards. In, in all this, we, we uh, this is what I would say as as believers in Christ, in a resurrected Christ, we we sh we can't lose hope. Time and again, we have seen God intervening, and there've been people who've been courageous. Uh, in all this, what I see is that the attack is on the household. That's where the attack yeah. is. It, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, and I think that would be a household which is strong on the Word of God, with parents who understand their role, and that they are uh, investing in eternal souls. If they take it that way. I think we can fight this with yeah. God's help. Well, let's be specific, yeah. uh, Jacob. When you say the war, the battle is now at home, in the home, in the family, what are you thinking? Give, give us some examples. Um, uh, w one of the things that we have done is uh, uh, we have relegated our authorities as parents to institutions. Yeah. One of the things is the, the whole educational system, if you see, how are we surprised that we had let the world catechize our kids. And if this generation is behaving the way it is, aren't we responsible for it? Why did we relegate our authority to the institutions to teach our kids? While we, as parents, have the responsibility to primarily disciple our kids. Um, and uh, so that's one of the examples I would give. Yeah. Or we, we have parents have a primary responsibility to even rear our children. Right. So, for example, if you remember in, what was it, 1989, Murphy Brown, she wanted to have a child by herself, and Vice President Dan Quayle condemned that idea that was being promoted on that show as, hey, fathers are valuable. Fathers, yeah. you know, you, this you aren't ordering something up out of a machine here. It's a, it's a child that is a product of a man and a woman, and that child deserves, every child born deserves to have a father and a mother. And that father and that mother have a responsibility to that child for at least the next 18 years to rear that child. And or or our children just are accessories to make us look good, you know? Yeah. And I, I'll add this to that, and it's very important that our families, our household needs to uh, need to come back to the idea of fulfilling the covenant responsibilities. As parents, we should be asking, are we dealing with each other, with our spouse, or even with our children as contractual deal of some sort? And I think that's what we have turned into. Yeah. So as parents, we have to be uh, thinking about assuming sacrificial responsibility towards each other that our children may 
look and learn. So if, if we are if you're wanting them to have hope, they have to see that hope working in the household between the parents as well. So I think we need to come back to this idea of a covenantal relationship that we maintain or on the truth which we actually have because of the revelation through God Himself, who has set up the very set up the very idea of household. It's His invention. Yeah. It's His doing. Our task is to submit to that and live by the standard that He has set. All right. In, in the last five minutes of our show, uh, I know we have one other thinker that we need to talk about. Now, as I see the progression of the dis, the sort of the descent, uh, yeah, there, there's a theme here where if you're not careful, you might miss it. But in each of these thinkers, if we've untethered God from reality, we've also untethered ourselves from who we are. So we're losing our humanity. Like right. that's clear Nietzsche, clearer in uh, Marx, uh, because the individual is lost. It's just a collective. And uh, in fact, Carl Truman wasn't sure if Marx actually had an understanding of human dignity. And I'd be surprised if Marx had any idea, uh, because he pretty much destroyed the individual there, because now it's just an economic transaction and just classes yeah. and whatever. But now we move to Darwin. Darwin's probably the most popular among the three because we learn about him in, in, in our science classes. And, uh, you know, phrases like survival of the fittest, natural selection, that, that's all commonplace. But in the next few minutes, what did Darwin bring to pretty much destroy teleology or, or that's a fancy well, word to say, we're, at the end, the end of man? Yeah, we're, we're, we're just... Um... We're just meat suits. We're just we're just materialist machines. Uh, Darwin makes us animals again. You talk about losing your humanity. Um, if we are just evolved accidents of nature, and uh, there's no more meaning to our existence than that, then our appetites and what we want to do in our appetites are the primary source of what we should do. Because we're just following whatever our natural urges are. Our base instincts, our base yeah. Our base instincts. And it, therefore, uh, our bodies just happen to look this way. So if we want to modify them, we can do so. It truly, and, and kids can be, if we want to modify our genetics for the next generation, if we want to, you know, clone or if we want to uh, use Cas9 CRISPR technology to create different genetically modified babies, then we can do that too. It's just whatever we want to order up. I think we have gone a level up from natural selection. It's no more merely natural selection. It's more like our selection of our future in terms of how we would look like. Uh, the ev so, so now the idea is controlling the very evolution itself, right? And, and to do that, one of the things that we are evolving as a result of that is the whole moral the moral and social evolution that's happening, right? Uh, so uh, we, I, I think if we are not careful in all this, what we will end up doing is that, uh, as we already discussed, is it's the annihilation of the self. That's what's going to happen. A and I think in so doing, we'll lose the very basis of why there is such a thing as human dignity why there is such a thing, uh, a flourishing society that we should aim for. So I think in all this, what we need is going back to the idea of recognizing who the creator is and not just any creator, a creator who has revealed his will to us and that he calls us to submit to him. For example, there's this recent story from NBC News Los Angeles. Albert Saninger, Saninger and Anthony Saninger, homosexual union, brought a lawsuit Friday in Los Angeles Superior Court against HRC Fertility and fertility specialist Dr. Branford Kolb, alleging breach of contract, medical malpractice, negligence, etc. They met more than 10 years ago, married, and decided to have a maximum of two children, both sons, the suit stated. But HRC and Kolb neg negligently, recklessly, and or, or intentionally transferred a female embryo into the senator's gestational carrier, according, according to the suit. And they're suing him because one of the two embryos is female. They ordered up a boy. Now, do we have a word for what it means when you 
pay money for a human being? Is there a word in our vocabulary? I, yeah. I think that's slavery. Yeah. It's all right. Well, you had the last word there, uh, Lenny. Thanks for that. I hear the music coming on, so we are ending our show for this evening. You've been listening to Apologetics.com radio, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. Our hope is that you've learned some aspect about the Christian worldview that strengthens your faith and make you want to learn more. Special thanks to my panel this evening, Jacob and Lenny, and to our behind-the-scenes sound engineer back there. Make sure that we sound good. Special thank you to our listeners. Until next time, good night. Good night.